Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth lecture in our series, which is sponsored by a Cheryl K. Coleman and Margaret E. Gateau professorship at the Oregon Humanity Center. The professorship is providing enrichment opportunities for my course about ancient Jewish art and architecture, and I'd like to thank the Oregon Humanity Center for its support. Zev Weiss is the Eliezer Sukenek Professor of Archaeology at the Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and director of the Sepphoris Excavations. He specializes in Roman and late antique art and architecture in the provinces of Syria, Palestine. He is the author of several books, including The Mosaics and the House of Dionysus at Sepphoris, The Sepphoris Synagogue, Deciphering an Ancient Message Through Its Archaeological and Socio-Historical Context, and Public Spectacles in Roman and Late Antique Palestine. He has won several honors and awards, including an Irene Levy Salah Book Prize in the Archaeology of Israel, Israel Science Foundation Grants, and fellowships at Harvard University and the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. I am thrilled that he will give today's lecture entitled, The Synagogue and the Shadow of the Temple and After Its Destruction. Please welcome Professor Weiss. Thank you, Chris, for the warm introduction. And I think I will share my screen and we'll be able to start with my uh, talk. So everyone can see the screen? Yeah, good. Okay, so my, the aim of my, my, my discussion, for me it's evening, for you it's the beginning of the day, it's uh, to really focus on the synagogue, on this institution that developed um, over time uh, from the late second temple period, first century BC, sec uh, first century C, and throughout late antiquity. In doing so, I will uh, concentrate on the architecture of the building, its art, artistic uh, um, uh, uh, decoration, and also liturgical furniture, uh, giving an overview of the building, which I think will uh, at least uh, give you some uh, uh, the opportunity to, th to see the building enlarge. So during the second temple period, the temple, was the main cultic uh, building um, in Jerusalem that um, any uh, Jew living in the Galilee, in Judea, even the diaspora aimed to it. That was the major vehicle uh, through which people uh, uh, participate their card, through the sacrifices and also prayers uh, uh, that were conducted in this uh, building. Along the temple, a new institution developed um, which we call the synagogue. Um, this institution is uh, well known in these resources and also in descriptions. Uh, in mo most of the time, it's, the, uh, it's called a synagogue to be together, synagogue. Uh, but there are also other names uh, known in inscription and sources referring to the building as, for example, Sabbateon, something that you do on Sabbath. Uh, or didaskaleon, uh, a kind of a school, a place that you study, a place of study. Pos eyuche, a place where you uh, pray. But this term in, in, is mainly known in the diaspora, not in, in, in Palestine, in, in Palestinian sources. And the first expression or the, um, the first indication of the existence of such an institution coming from the diaspora, from Egypt, from the late third uh, century BC or uh, second century uh, BCE. In ancient Palestine, today uh, Israel, the first example of synagogue of such an institutions is uh, known from the second half of the first century BCE and mainly in the first century CE. I'm talking archeological uh, evidence. One of the, uh, I would say, the first building to be identified as a synagogue was uh, excavated already in the 60s, in 1960 uh, at Masada. This building that we see here uh, in, in two images um, was built by the Zealots who uh, were in Masada uh, during the uh, first revolt against uh, uh, Rome. 
they uh, use one of Herod's uh, buildings, um, assumably a stable, and transform in, in, it tra transformed it into a synagogue, uh, which means they build those stepped benches, um, use the columns in order to support uh, the roof, we see over here, and also a small room in which uh, Yadin uh, uncovers several, uh, several uh, um, uh, scroll, several scroll pieces uh, which were buried in the debris, indicating that over here in this small room, they probably kept some of the scroll used by the people in this, uh, in this uh, uh, building. It's important to indicate that the date of this building is around 70 uh, CE in the course of the uh, uh, first revolt against, it's against Rome. And it is something that was built in a second phase. In contrast, we have an, a great example of a synagogue um, with the same uh, layout, with the same pattern coming, coming from Gamla. Gamla is situated in the Golan Heights, northern part of uh, Israel. And uh, this building was constructed uh, from the outset as a synagogue. Uh, as you may see in the picture, also in the plan, it's a rectangular uh, hall having benches all around on four sides of the prayer hall, of the, of the gathering hall. We can see very clearly the benches. And then there are four rows of columns to support uh, the roof. Uh, whoever needed to enter the building uh, came from the south into the building. And then inside beyond the benches, we have a small niche. There's a study uh, room, and there's also a water channel uh, transforming a, a, a water from outside, from somewhere, from some well outside, uh, through the synagogue into a ritual bus, which exists here to the south of the building. And a nice reconstruction of the, of the building, giving you a kind of an idea how uh, uh, this building was uh, arranged uh, is in this image uh, in which we can see the ritual bath, the entrance from the south and the benches all around and the four rows of columns to support the, uh, the roof, which had clerestory uh, upper uh, windows in order to illuminate the uh, inner space of the building. Another uh, structure uh, excavated more recently in uh, Magdala on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, that's also in northern part of Israel. And, and this uh, um, building also followed the same pattern as those buildings we uh, saw before. And it has a, a study hall. Uh, entrance was probably from the west through the study hall into the gathering hall of the of the synagogue, and we can see the benches all again all around, and also benches along the wind uh, along the walls, and there were two rows of columns again to support the uh, the roof. In all those places, we see. I mean, it's relatively. Uh, uh, medium size, uh, medium size uh, hall. It's very, it's very hard to calculate the number of people that can enter this building because it's a world of also the question whether people sit only on the benches or also on rags or on uh, uh, portable wooden uh, uh, benches. Uh, that really makes uh, the question, more, I mean, uh, answering this question more complicated. One of the, uh, um, uh, one of the things that really characterized these synagogues in contrast to the previous examples is the decorations. Um, remains of wall paintings were found in the building. You can see some wall paintings, also the columns are decorated with frescoes. And there's also mosaics. At least the Eastern Isle was paved with mosaics. Also one of the side rooms had another, a, 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 another a, a mosaic with a very low a range of colors, but still colorful a mosaic. One of the major and interesting uh, find uncovered in this building is the famous uh, a stone, a, a, a famous stone, a famous Magdala stone, uh, uncovered within within the, the the main hall. 
Uh, it's about um, 60 by 55 centimeters, and it's, it's a low pedestal and um, uh, decorated with uh, all sorts of uh, images, mainly um, geometrical and floral uh, design, but there are also some, um, some other uh, uh, Jewish symbols like the menorah and uh, some amphoras on either side. We'll talk about it later, later on. So, and this type of synagogue, I mean, the three examples that I show you uh, till now, uh, Matsada, Gamla, and, and, and Magdala, they're all dated to the first century, late second century, sorry, late first century uh, BC or first century CE. Such building at some places continued to be used even after the destruction of the temple, after 70 C. See, like the building at Kiryat Sefer, which is in Judea, this building, uh, uh, for example, was in continual use until the Bar Kokhba revolt, until 135 uh, uh, CE. So when we're looking on the first group of buildings, um, and I added in this uh, diagram two others, in Rhodium and also in Modin, and we have, uh, we have a group of uh, buildings that follow certain characters. They all contain benches arranged around the four sides of the, of the, of the hall, sometimes in smaller uh, buildings, like here at Sefer, only three sides of the, of, of, of the hall. They all contain columns to support the roof. Uh, most of the time, they arrange in four aisles. But again, in the small buildings, they can be two, uh, uh, two uh, parallel uh, lines. But they all, I mean, it's, it's, it's a question of the size of the building, uh, which, uh, uh, um, which eventually uh, uh, define the number of columns that needed to support the roofs. Then um, what else is characterized those buildings? The lack of architectural expression outside the building. When you stand outside, you don't see it's anything that indicate that we're talking about a synagogue. There's no sign, there's no uh, decorative elements, no other, uh, 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 no menorah, nothing to indicate that it is a, a synagogue. One thing that is really characterized as synagogue, the lack of clear orientation. And if you look on the plan of the building and uh, each of them is oriented differently. Some of them are oriented in east-west direction. Some of them are north-south. Some of them in, in different uh, 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 directions. So we clearly see that uh, those buildings have no, uh, no clear orientation. At times, they're inside the hall is a niche, small niche, like the one at uh, Gamla. And or side rooms like the one at um, at Masada, but those are not necessarily exist uh, everywhere. And also, some building contain also a, a water installation, be a ritual bath like uh, at um, Gamla. It's also existing in uh, Rhodium and other uh, elements uh, that hard to define, but they're connected with a uh, water. It is a nice uh, um, example of such building. It's a new building, mm -hmm. but uh, constructed to imitate uh, those uh, synagogue, late second temple period synagogue. It's, uh, um, it's located uh, today in Nazareth. There's a second temple period village um, for tourism. And one of the buildings is imitating the synagogue. And the picture here um, really gives us the impression of the inter uh, internal space of those uh, synagogues, where uh, people sitting on benches, uh, three, four benches arranged around uh, uh, the, 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 the hall. And then the four uh, row of columns, or two row of columns, actually uh, uh, hold the central space where the attention of everybody is directed, everybody is sitting on the benches, is directed to the person who stand at the center. So since the temple um, fulfilled the religious needs of the Jewish uh, people, I mean, who, whoever needed to do any, uh, to participate in religious activity, just need to go to the temple, uh, sacrifice, or even uh, uh, pray. 
uh, the temple. So the question is, uh, what was the uh, purpose of those uh, institutions that developed alongside the temple? They were not aimed to replace the cult of the, uh, of, of, of the temple, but to complement it to a certain extent. Reading one of the inscriptions that was found in Jerusalem and is dated to the late second temple uh, period, uh, referring to a synagogue that was not found or completely uh, demolished in antiquity, but the inscription written in Greek clearly indicate the existence of a synagogue, but in addition, refer, refer, also, to the, refer also to the use or the uh, purposes of that building. And the translation of the inscription uh, uh, reads, uh, Theodotos, the son of Vetenos, priest, and Archisynagogos is the head of the synagogue. He's the son of an Archisynagogos and a grandson of the Archisynagogos. It's a great family. But now come the main purpose of the, of the, of, of the, of the inscription. He built this synagogue for the reading of the law the Torah, and the study of the commandments, and the, and the guest house, and room, water, insulation, hosting those who need the from God, etc. So here at the beginning, it really indicates the purpose of those synagogues. Um, they were not aimed for praying. They definitely were not aimed for uh, sacrifices, but they aimed for, for reading of the law and study of the commandments. The same expression appears at uh, uh, by Philon of Alexandria in Contra Apion, where he said that we, the Jews, go to the synagogue on Sabbath to study the law. And it's also referred in Luke 4, uh, 6 and 22, where it is indicated that Jesus, when he came to his hometown, Nazareth, on Sabbath, he went to the synagogue. And there they gave him a scroll. He read from the scroll. And after he completed the reading, he put aside the scroll and gave his sermon. So if we're taking those, I mean, the inscription, we're taking away also the, the sources. And we have several other sources indicating the same notion that the purpose of the, of the synagogue <coughs> in late second temple period was mainly it was a kind of a communal house. It was not a religious building. It was a communal house where people came together to read the law, to study the law, and also study the commandments to understand what is exactly mean in the, I mean, what is exactly mean uh, uh, the meaning of the uh, laws in the Torah. Now, if you look going back, to those uh, uh, buildings, especially the reconstruction from Nazareth, we can understand the layout of the building. It was designed, uh, um, uh, it was designed purposely in order to accommodate the needs of the communities at, the, at that time. People came to listen, to look at the reader, to look at the preacher, and that's why they sat all around. There was no need to orient the, to orient the building in any direction because direction was not important. What was important what was what was done inside the building, not outside, inside the building. And that's why people said all around, whereas the person who read the scripture or the person who uh, gave uh, uh, the sermon stood, stood at the center. And that's how people, and when people sat all around, they could hear and, and listen, and they can see it, and they, they can see exactly what happened in that uh, building. So that's what really characterized the building, the synagogues of the late Second Temple uh, period. Now we're getting to the synagogue in late antiquity. And when I'm talking about late antiquity, I and mean, usually it's a uh, mid third century and, and and, and onwards. After the suppression of the Bar Kokhva revolt in 135, there's a, there's a gap between the archaeological finds and the literary sources, the Jewish literary sources. The Jewish literary sources provide a lot of information about 
this institution. It discusses all sorts of aspects, prayers, activities, uh, type of activities, and also uh, all sorts of uh, behavior that used to be in the temple, they were transformed to the synagogue. For the example, blowing of the shofar, the four speeches, um, the blessing of the priest, all sorts of information will move, uh, all sorts of uh, decrees will move from the temple to the synagogue. But in, so, so we have a lot of information about the synagogue liturgy and how it was built, constructed. Um, once the temple was destroyed, you needed to replace it with a different institution. And that's how the synagogue, I mean, the liturgy of the synagogue started to develop in the third century and onwards. And when I'm saying there's a gap between the um, little resources and archaeological finds, um, I mean that once, I mean, uh, um, after the suppression of the Balkhva revolt, we don't have any synagogue. There's no evidence for a synagogue up to the third century, up to the early third century or even mid third century. It's about 80 years, uh, 90 years that till now we haven't found any, any evidence for constructions of synagogue. This is one of the example uh, recently uncovered in Majdulia in the uh, Golan Heights. It's an example of a synagogue that late second temple period synagogue that continued to be used up to the early third century. There's another example, maybe from the late say, first century, early second century at Echuvat Kana in the Galilee. But those are questionable building. Construction of new structure with new uh, layout, with a different layout compared to the earlier building appear for the first time in, sometimes in the early third century. And it, these are the two examples. The one from Chabad Tiberias, that's at the top left, a synagogue which has four aisles, a main hall and, and, and one aisle to the west and two others uh, to the uh, east. And the synagogue at Chibet Vadi Hamam, which is, as I said, dated to the, um, to the uh, uh, third century, first half of the uh, third century SCE. So from now on, I mean, we have many examples of synagogues. Um, and the map here give you an impression of the regions, and I will go over the regions where um, there's evidence for uh, synagogues from third century onwards throughout the antiquity. And same throughout the antiquity, I mean, the latest construction is sometimes in the sixth century or early seventh century. So we, we really have a, a large uh, extent, a, a large period, a long period and extensive uh, uh, building activities of synagogue. And those synagogues, some of them uh, lasted uh, for many years. So we have a big group, large group in the, up, in the upper Galilee and the lower Galilee. There are many examples in the Golan Heights in the Jordan Valley around, uh, around uh, Bet She'an, Skytopolis. And then there are synagogues in Judea. Um, and then there are several exa other examples in the cities along the uh, uh, coast, uh, the Mediterranean uh, coast. So uh, I, I would say that uh, Broadly speaking, these synagogues really are characterized by diversity. I mean, um, although I'm going to discuss uh, some of those buildings and define them for the sake of uh, my presentation, so things will be more clear, I will discuss them uh, according to some groups, but this, those groups have no uh, chronological significance. And I would say that a, a synagogue construction from the uh, late third century and throughout late antiquity, really characterized by, uh, by, 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 by diversity. So we'll start now to uh, discuss uh, the, uh, some of those synagogues and I will start with the monumental synagogues, uh, which appear mainly in the Galilee and in the Golan. And there's 
few exam few sites on a screen um, Korzim, uh, Baram, and Umel Kanatir, uh, which is, uh, Umel Kanatir is on the Golanites, the other two are in the uh, Galilee. Those synagogues are characterized by a uh, monumentality. They build with ashlars and have a uh, three row of columns inside the, the, the prayer hall. Now we are talking about prayer hall. There are entrances, either three entrances or one entrance on the southern wall of the building. So people enter through south and looking northward and then entering the, the, the prayer hall. And, and inside the building, the floor is made uh, uh, with uh, stone pavers either basalt or a lime a, a stone. So the impression of those buildings is that we have monuments and they can date from um, late third, early fourth century and up to the fifth, sixth century. It depends on the site and also depends on the interpretation of the, of the actual uh, finds. Um, I will use one example in order to uh, um, uh, show it uh, in uh, some more details. And I'll, I'll use the one in the synagogue from Korazim, which is dated to the early fourth century. So here we see there's a staircase uh, coming from south uh, and to the uh, building facade. And what really characterized those synagogues is the decoration. They're all architectural decorations. Um, it can be um, uh, decorating the facade uh, uh, or decorating the, um, the entablatures inside the building. And all the decorations are, are made in relief. And the type of decoration we'll discuss later in the, in the, in the, in the last part of my uh, presentation. But anyone who uh, uh, watched uh, anyone who looked at the uh, building facade was really impressed by uh, the arrangement of the doors. The central door was usually higher, and then the side doors were uh, a bit uh, lower, but they all were decorated with those elements. Now, get going uh, inside the, the prayer hall, we see the three aisles, I mean, the three row of columns with pedestals, and columns, ionic capitals in this case, and then we have the entablature, um, the architrave and the frieze and the, and the cornice, they're all decorated with uh, in relief. We see here a ionic capital, it's kind of a composite uh, capital who is uh, familiar with, uh, with those elements. And here we see the, the frieze, and with all sorts of decoration in the architrave, the frieze, and we have the cornice and they're all decorated with very meticulous, uh, 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 meticulous uh, uh, work. And um, so this is uh, um, uh, one example. Some of those synagogues, what I call the Galilean group, um, have, I mean, constructed the same way, monumentally built with three row of columns, pedestal columns and uh, capitals, etc. But instead of having a, a, a stone, a, 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 instead of having a, a, a pavers, and the, 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 the prayer hall was paved with mosaic. A great example is the synagogue from Chorvat Vadi Hamam, where we follow the same pattern, it's a rectangular hall, entrance from the south, and then we have the three row of columns. Usually at the corner, there are heart-shaped uh, uh, columns, but instead of uh, a stone pavers with the mosaic uh, floor, and in the synagogue at Meroth, uh, it's in Upper Galilee, the first phase and the first uh, floor was mosaic, but then they decided to replace it for a uh, stone uh, pavers. Now, Another group of a uh, synagogue are uh, those uh, uh, constructed uh, mainly in the fifth and sixth century, uh, influenced by the Christian basilica. Um, I brought here uh, two examples: one in Hamat Tiberias and the other one Bet Alpha. Um, Hamat Tiberias it's really on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, and Bet Alpha is not far from Scythopolis. Um, in the Jordan Valley. 
what really characterized those synagogues and the first, that, first thing is that they were influenced by the shape of the Christian basilica. Whoever familiar with the Christian basilica know that it's a basilical building. It contained an, an, an atrium, and then we have an narthex, and then we have the prayer hall, which is arranged, arranged as a basilical hall. We have two row of columns, not three as we saw in the previous examples, but two row of columns dividing the prayer hall into main hall and two aisles. And then at the southern end of the building with an apse, indicating the direction of the synagogue with the bima in front of it. And then there are benches all around as we have uh, elsewhere. And here in Chabad Tiberias, it's basically the same idea with the narthex and then the prayer hall, though we have here three row of columns, but the division uh, remain the same with an apse uh, on the southern part of the building. Once we're taking out the, the, the uh, mosaic or any, any Jewish indication and we look only at the plan, it's really a complete uh, a, a, a copy of the, Christian, of the Christian basilica. Now, those synagogues, what characterize those synagogues beyond its plan, it's the, the decorations, they're all decorated with mosaic floors. I mean, the walls outside have hardly any decoration. Usually they were plastered and simple uh, white wash. <coughs> and also the inner space, the walls inside were either uh, uh, plastered uh, at time, they have some minor uh, wall decoration, but nothing in particular. The emphasis was given on the floor. And we will talk the floors later on. And here we can see we have a good look on the Bet, a Bet Alpha synagogue. We're standing right at the entrance, the main entrance, looking at the main hall, the two aisles, and the apse at the end of the building. Other synagogues, and here I really group different kinds of synagogues, just to il uh, illustrate my, my point. Some buildings are a broad, a, a broad building, which means that the focal point is in the longer uh, wall and the entrances are on the shorter walls. For example, and we look on at Susia, this is in Judea, and the same pattern appears in Chuvat uh, Shema, that's in the Galilee. Although the layout of the building and those two sides are similar. One have columns to support the roof and the other don't have columns. And at, at Susia, we have a mosaic floor and in Chuvat uh, Shema, it's not clear if it had mosaic, maybe it had something else, but we don't have clear evidence. Then we have other examples. It's a, a, a long a, a rectangle, a small building, but the entrances are on the side walls. And here in Bet Leontis, which is a just small, simple room with mosaic used as a prayer hall. So if we're looking on the various examples, which date from the late third, fourth century up to the uh, um, sixth or early seventh century, it depends on each building. I, I'm not saying that all of them were constructed in such a large span, but basically, um, the, the, the synagogues can be dated to the fourth century, the basilica building for fifth, sixth century, and, and the Galilean synagogue can be late third, but there are also examples from the fifth century. What, what I meant in, 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 in this uh, uh, simple conclusion saying that uh, you, don't, you don't have to look or search for certain pattern to indicate it's uh, the date of the building. Uh, the date should rely only, only on the finds and themselves as, uh, and we have to look on each and every building uh, separately. But what uh, really uh, uh, characterized all those buildings of either types is the fact that they were designed to accommodate group of people who participated in the, I mean, who came into the building, into the synagogue and participated in their different type of uh, litur liturgical uh, activities. They sat on benches or 
portable benches or even on the on the floors. And what the major change, with, which also finds some expression in the liturgical furniture, is the fact that now the prayers became the major component of the synagogue alongside the, the, the reading of the, of the scriptures. But in contrast to the previous period where the reading of the scripture and the ceremonies were the, the, on, the only activities conducted in the building and the prayers were held in the temple, now the synagogue was designated mainly for prayers uh, alongside with the uh, reading of the of the Torah of the scriptures and also a ceremony is held in the building. Now, when looking on the architectural layout of the of the synagogue, whether the one in Hamati Berias, whether in Bet Alpha, whether in 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 in, in Korazim, Um El Kanatir, you name it, there's a major change in those buildings. Uh, which uh, stand in contrast to what was a, 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 a common in the late Second Temple period. In contrast to the early building, which really lacked similar orientation, now in the synagogue constructed from the third century and onwards, they are all directed to Jerusalem. They are all directed to Jerusalem. This is a major change because, because it's influence the activities held in the building and also the litur liturgical furniture, which we'll see inside the building. This change is derived from Tanaic law. Tanaim were the rabbis who lived in the second and third century. And the Sifra Deuteronomy, it's a Tanaic source, it's rabbinic source from the second, early third century. And it says, it discussed the prayers and direction of prayers forever, wherever you stay on the globe. And I will read only the, 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 the phrases that I emphasize on screen. And they said, those who are outside the land of Israel, turn towards the land of Israel when they pray. Those who are in the land of Israel must turn towards Jerusalem when they pray. Those are, who are in Jerusalem must turn towards the temple when they pray. So consequently, all Israel will pray towards the same place. And the map really illustrates the decree stipulated in this uh, in this Tanaic uh, source, it doesn't make it does make different where exactly you are located in the land of Israel, whether in the Galilee, whether in the coastal city, whether in the Jordan Valley or in Judea. You have to direct your prayers toward Jerusalem. If you're in the north, you look southward. If, the, if you live on the coastal area, look, you look eastward. If you're in the Jordan Valley, you look westward. And if you are in, the, in Judea, you look northward. You orient your building northward. So that's what really influenced the synagogue constructed in the land of Israel and also in diaspora. That's true also in diaspora. All the diaspora synagogues whether it be in Ostia or in, uh, 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 in Asia Minor, they're all directed to Jerusalem because, uh, because uh, it follows the idea that prayers, which become the main component in the synagogue, should be directed to Jerusalem. Now, going back into the buildings, we see that those synagogues constructed in the third century, for example, like Hamat Tiberias, the orientation of the building, and I define orientation based of the on the columns, the orientation of the building, it's to the south. And Tiberias is located in the, in the Galilee, in the northern part of Israel. So whoever, whoever uh, um, used the synagogue or uh, um, directed its, its prayers toward Jerusalem. But in those synagogues constructed in, in, in the third century, Nothing beyond the direction of the building, nothing inside the building 
indicated the direction of prayers. I mean, the fact that you were in a building that is oriented towards Jerusalem in the third century, it was enough. But what, probably that was not enough for everybody because at one point, pr probably towards the late third and mainly in the first half of the second century, we, over the third of the fourth century, sorry, in the late third century or early fourth century, we see that in synagogue like Hamat Tiberia, and that's also true in a, Vadi Hamam, and it's true also in Huvat Shema, the same phenomena. We see that they making some changes in this area and building a bima. And the bima emphasizing the needs of directing the, the prayers uh, towards Jerusalem. That's creating a, a kind a, 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 of a, co a focal point within the structure that indicating the direction of prayer, but it's evolved also another change, which which I will discuss in a second. In building in synagogue constructed already by the fourth century, they are built together with the bima, becoming a permanent element within the synagogue. Any synagogue constructed in the fourth century onwards is built with such an element. So. Not only the building itself now is directed toward Jerusalem, but they also created inside the prayer hall an element that emphasized the direction of prayers toward Jerusalem. Now, on this bima, uh, although in most cases it was found uncovered as a plain uh, elevated platform, Nothing from the superstructure remained, but small elements, all sorts of uh, small elements, and especially artistic expression uh, found in various places indicated the nature of the element that stood on the bima. And we know that the teva, the, uh, a portable chest or a permanent ark was installed at that time on the bima and that chest, the teva or the permanent ark contained the scrolls. So in contrast to the synagogues in the late second temple period or in those synagogues built in the third century without any focal point, the scrolls were installed in a side room like the one in Masada. And when needed, they, they were brought inside the, uh, in the, the inside the main hall, either in a small chest or by hand or you know it. But once they decided to emphasize, to install, to to uh, uh, to build that bima, the chest or the the the, the ark was constructed above the above the uh, above the the the, um, the, the bima. And we see, for example, in Bet Sharim, the two uh, the wall decoration, especially this one, uh, creating the image of a kind of a, a dikula or a niche uh, with a kind of a chest, wooden chest with two legs, with uh, um, scrolls lying inside it. Also in Rome, we have example of the thorax with with scrolled. Uh, um, set in uh, those compartments and also the Hamad uh, Tiberias synagogue portray a more permanent uh, in art uh, that uh, was uh, in the synagogue and in some synagogue with a very uh, established, a very permanent uh, arc built of stone decorated with all sorts of uh, decoration like the one at Umil Kanatir. So it's varied. Uh, from synagogue to synagogue. Some of them have uh, portable tevas, and some of them have um, wooden uh, uh, um, arcs, and uh, others would have more permanent uh, um, elements like the one in uh, Umel Kanatir. And I bring Umel Kanatir because it was, uh, it has, a, uh, they did their anastolosis, which means they, they found all the elements in the debris and ju just uh, re-established them uh, back in place, and it's it's a great it's a, a great a great example illuminating uh, my uh, point. Another element 
that uh, uh, was found in more than several synagogues, uh, both in Judea and the Galilee, are the seven branch menorahs, those candelabra, um, imitating the uh, menorah and that was in the, in the temple. Uh, those menorahs were made either by limestone, like the one from Hamat Tiberias, or in marble, uh, from uh, Susia and the other examples for other uh, side. It is uh, well accepted that those uh, menorahs stood probably next to the Torah, like the one from Maon, uh, from Judea, and the reconstruction, when looking from outside into the building, we see the ark, the uh, built ark, and the menorah uh, standing uh, next to it, and that's also an element and that uh, probably was uh, uh, quite familiar in uh, uh, other uh, synagogue. And it was aimed to emphasize, uh, emphasize the synagogue and the connection with the temple, uh, sanctification of the synagogue. And, 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 so, and, and so, because we have all sorts of elements, as I mentioned before, that were transformed from the temple into the synagogue. And this is, and this is in one, uh, one of them. So now moving uh, uh, on to uh, my last uh, uh, part, uh, I mean, the last part of my lecture, which will be a bit elaborate, uh, focusing on the art of the synagogue. I mean, so far we discussed the architecture of the synagogue, we also discussed the liturgy of the synagogue, and now we'll devote some time to the uh, to artistic expression in, in ancient synagogue uh, art, and we'll start with the second temple uh, period. Broadly speaking, we have a nice uh, collection of elements. Uh, we have some uh, architectural features coming from Gamla, like uh, um, uh, capitals, there's also some lintels decorated with, uh, uh, with the reliefs, very simple, uh, mostly chiseling, but also some relief. Uh, decorating the building that uh, appear also uh, only in um, only in, uh, in 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 Gamla at Magdala we have uh, uh, further evidence for decorating the synagogue can be wall painting and can be also mosaic we see I mean, the two images colorful images and then in the in the center we have this uh, the the Magdala stone which is decorated in relief with as I mentioned before with, uh, um, with various uh, um, uh, geometrical and stylized floral uh, depictions, in addition so, to some temple imagery, like the, um, like the menorah, the, um, the amphora, and other a few elements portrayed on the stone. Broadly speaking, one thing is really missing, or we, we may say that the decorative program in the late Second Temple Synagogue is really uh, emphasizing or using just um, 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 geometrical and floral design. No figurative images were employed in the late Second Temple period. And that's really a, a quite common in general in the uh, late Second Temple period where we have very few expression uh, or you and use of a figurative images, they do appear in Herodian palaces, uh, but not uh, employed by a uh, simple uh, people, not to speak in, in those uh, synagogues. In the synagogue, uh, in the late antique synagogue, there is a big change. Um, there is a, a huge change uh, in, uh, in quantity, in quality, and mainly in imagery. Um, and the decorations um, can be generally divided uh, um, according to the type of synagogues. In the, monument, in the mon monumental buildings um, like Korazim and Baram, the decorations, uh, I mean, uh, we, in most cases, we're talking about architectural decoration elements, architectural elements that were um, decorated with, uh, with, uh, with all sorts of reliefs, um, with a big range of motives from geometrical, floral, but, and this is the big change uh, in, the, in the late antique synagogue, 
employment also of figurative images with all sorts of figurative images, human figures, animals, but also mythological things are included in those in those synagogues. And let me let me uh, um, illuminate my, uh, my, 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 my my argument in few examples. So we're looking here into um, uh, friezes coming from uh, from Korzim. Uh, in the one here, we see a floral design, also geometrical design, and uh, some uh, um, acanthus leaves over here, a wreath. This wreath uh, is uh, uh, very uh, unique. It's what uh, with Heracles knot at the bottom, quite common in Roman uh, architecture. But this frieze is even uh, uh, more in, uh, intricate. It has a, a row of it's broken, but it had originally a row of, uh, of uh, um, a grape uh, uh, medallions. Uh, we can clearly see the, medall the, the grapes over here. And then each medallion contained figurative images. Here in the center, for example, we can see two images, two figures, one and two. And the angle is not quite well, but they are treating uh, grapes, uh, making wine. And this one is a shepherd. So we do see uh, all sorts of, I mean, the various type of, of, uh, the great, of elements. And in other synagogues, we have, we have an eagle, depiction of an eagle. Over here, a wreath with a menorah. And another wreath with a reckless knot with an image, with a bust of unidentified of unidentified uh, figure. Another synagogue, which contain, I mean, a vast amount of uh, architectural decoration is Kfar Mahum. And Kfar Mahum, it's uh, Kfar Mahum, uh, Kapanahum, it's, it's, it's a um, long discussed building. And, and, and people were debating about the date of the building. I'm not going to go into it. But what, what really is uh, uh, characterizing uh, Kapernaum is the um, amount, the abundance of various decorations in uh, that uh, synagogue. It goes from lintels with capitals, Corinthian capitals, and here there's a nice example of Corinthian capitals with Jewish symbols. And then we have friezes with uh, uh, cantus leaves, with all sorts of uh, fruits, gray, pomegranates, flower, uh, a kind of flower, uh, et cetera. So we can see the, 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 the variety in uh, decorating within architectural decorations in those synagogues. And as you uh, get to know more and more, you see how diverse are the decorations. Most of them are, contain in, in floral design, but it also uh, includes uh, figurative images uh, in ranging from life, from animals to uh, human figures. In the synagogues um, that are decorated uh, with mosaic, we, um, I mean, over there, it's much more elaborated. And we have many more, uh, um, uh, many more uh, uh, depictions uh, that uh, really expand the scope of our knowledge on uh, Jewish art and synagogue uh, and synagogue art. So I, I really would like to um, give a kind of an overview of the type of mosaics. I mean, we can really devote time on each and every mosaic, but really would like to take a, a broad view on the type of mosaics and the depictions that exist in those mosaic carpets. So mosaic carpets featuring figurative images, as I said, took various uh, forms. Uh, for example, here in Hamad Tiberias, Naran, and Bet Alpha, we have the central carpet in, in the main hall, the central carpet divided into three unequal panels, bands. Whereas in Sepharis, it's only the drawing of the mosaic. We have then the mosaic is a, is is a, a, um, arranged with a, a, is divided into a seven uh, with a seven uh, panels. 
In all four synagogue buildings, the depiction of the zodiac appear in the center of the mosaic carpet, but the architectural facade, right? Over here, the architectural facade, the panel of the architectural facade with a uh, some Jewish symbols, the menorahs uh, and the four species, uh, etc., are located uh, in the area close to the bima. And the biblical themes, like the Akeda over here, the binding of Isaac, or uh, Daniel in the in lion, then are uh, uh, presented elsewhere in the mosaic. What really characterized the mosaic of these mosaics is the arrangement of the panels. They're all directed in one direction. And the flow of scenes along the building axis from the entrance, which is located over here, right? In all those buildings. And uh, yes, and, 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 and the direction of the panels and the scenes along the building's axis uh, as I said before, from the entrance uh, to the Bima area were similarly executed in these uh, buildings. From the fourth century, second half of the fourth century, fifth century, and Naran and Bet Alpha dated to the sixth century. Now, unlike the four examples I've just presented, several other late antique synagogues have compositions bearing an overall pattern covering the entire mosaic floor. And for example, the synagogue at Engedi, which was just recently uh, published in the final report as a one complete uh, carpet, and the uh, synagogue at Hamat Iberias, each area had a different uh, mosaic uh, carpet. Carpet with, carpets with slightly more intricate overall designs are known at Maon Nirim, Gaza, Mayumas, as well as the small synagogue at Bet Shean. This is the one in Gaza, Maon Nirim. This is a part from the mosaic, and this, unfortunately, I don't have a colorful mosaic from, the, from Bet Leontis. The figurative images at this site are arranged in a series of vine medallions with vine branches issuing from an amphora located at the bottom of the mosaic. You can see it over here. Oh, sorry. Right over here and also uh, over here. The number of vertical and horizontal rows changes from one side to the other, depending on the size of the hole. The row on the vertical axis features animal and objects associated with agriculture. And the medallions in each parallel row portray birds and animals positioned antithetically along the axis. And you can really see it uh, in, in, in this uh, image and also in the others. Actually, uh, those patterns are also well known in churches, uh, like in Shalal, in uh, Gaza, in other churches throughout in the country. Now, when we're going into details, and mainly in the first group of synagogues, those decorated with uh, uh, large uh, panels, um, we have, uh, I would like to present some of, the, of those uh, uh, panels and discuss them more, uh, uh, more in, in some details. So we have an um, example, I mean, I mean, we have the zodiac at the center of many mosaics. Uh, here I brought only four of them, but uh, today, to date, we know of seven uh, zodiacs uh, installed in a various synagogue, including Hukuk, the latest example ex excavated in recent years. So the zodiac actually contained, uh, contained two circles, right? A central, the outer circle, and compass within a square. Helios, or depiction of the sun, is portrayed in the center. And then in the outer circle, the depiction of the 12th sign, followed by inscription of each sign. And then the outer, at the outer corner, depicts the four seasons of the year, again, followed with the inscription of each season. In many cases, the depiction of Sepharis, 
is slightly different. I mean, it's so it follows the same pattern, but it contains some some differences. Uh, for example, um, in those four uh, three panels and um, zodiacs, and also in um, at Hukok with the depiction of Helios, but in Sepphoris with the sun itself. I mean, the sun itself, not not the uh, personification of the sun but the sun itself riding a quadriga. Then on the other circle, we do have the 12th sign in addition to the 12 months. And the inscriptions are double referring to both the sign and the month. And it's the really following the well-known calendar. And then in the corner, we do have the four seasons, but they are also uh, um, uh, portrayed alongside with various symbols a cart rising each and every season, whereas in the other uh, sides we have mainly the figure itself with one or two uh, images, uh, uh, symbols that characterize the season. So, in in many ways, we do know that the, the those those communities or the artists who created those mosaic use certain pattern, but there are also some uh, changes from one side to the other, and and the the the, the, the zodiacs. Uh, uncover in Hukok uh, and elaborate the number of images uh, uh, included in the uh, in, uh, in, in, in the zodiac that thus uh, indicating or emphasizing the uh, uh, variation of this depiction. One thing that really characterized synagogue art, and that's uh, in contrast to a uh, Christian uh, 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 Christian basilicas is the inclusion of uh, biblical depictions in the floor. Uh, whereas in, in, in churches, you won't find biblical depictions on the floor, but rather on the uh, building's wall. And I brought here only a few examples to illuminate the nature of, uh, of those, uh, of those uh, depictions. So the first, uh, I, I mean, I really must uh, uh, emphasize uh, uh, the fact that Hukok will appear uh, more than uh, in one uh, panel because the Hukok synagogue really um, expanded our knowledge uh, with regard to the, uh, the scope and the number of biblical depiction, depiction included in the, uh, in, in the mosaic, in, in, in the synagogue uh, mosaic uh, art. And it's really uh, interesting to see all sorts of details in that uh, mosaic. So we have here in the first uh, panel uh, um, uh, expressing the story of Noah and the flood. We see the animals um, coming or going into what I believe is the, the ark itself. And we don't see Noah and, and, not, and neither is the sun, but we do see that the animals coming in pairs with two camels, two elephants, uh, to uh, leopards, uh, to um, uh, donkeys, etc., uh, to ostriches, uh, and and so it's really uh, no, no no doubt that it's really a follow uh, uh, the story. I mean, the big the story of the Noah and the flood. Uh, the same topic, though uh, um, iconographically completely uh, different, uh, is known from I would say uh, almost hundred year uh, from Gerasa. In uh, Jordan, in Jerash, in Jordan, uh, where a synagogue was uncovered under a church, and we have only a black and white mosaic, and we see the animals. Uh, this is the, the complete panel. It's not fully preserved, but it's a. This is the complete uh, panel again depicting the animals in pairs. But here at the corner, and this is the blow up of the of the image. We have the name of Noah's son, Shem and Yafet in Greek. And then we have a dove with the, with the, with the olive branch in, uh, in her uh, um, beak following the, uh, the biblical uh, depiction, the, big, the biblical story. Another depiction, which I, I, mean, I find it magnificent, with so many details, uh, again, coming from Hukok, it's the Tower of Babel, the story of Tower of Babel from Genesis 11, where we see the people, I mean, all sorts of nations building uh, 
the uh, tower itself and the, and the, 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 the loops, the stones, the cutters, the, all the people that are participating in building that uh, tower. And the story basically for, I mean, it, it's really uh, for anyone who is dealing with Roman construction can see in this, uh, in this uh, depiction, all sorts of tools um, and, and all sorts of uh, construction tools that were used in uh, buildings in antiquity. And it has parallels in Roman art, but here we're getting a, a, a many more uh, new details. And um, the story itself really followed the, the, the biblical story, but something that I did not mention, and it's appear in at Hukuk, at Hukuk, but also at uh, other uh, sites where a uh, biblical depiction are inserted in mosaic, uh, the story tells, I mean, the, the panel tells the biblical story, but added also some information or the story was formulated also in the light of of the of of, of rabbinic literature, uh, which um, expand uh, in many ways the um, the, um, the 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 biblical story. And I, I use only one example over here. We see two people fighting, right? One is holding an axe, and one is holding a so. And according to uh, um, uh, um, uh, rabbinic sources, uh, the people did not verse the same language. I mean, they couldn't under one could not understand the, the other. So someone came and someone asked for a, a hammer or for a, an axe, and someone else who did not understand him brought him a saw instead. So they started to fight. I told you to bring this, and you brought me that, and. This uh, way, uh, um, uh, um, the rabbis explain why they thought and they couldn't complete. I mean, what did God went down and tried to confuse them, and the confusion was created by by by, by those activities that are portrayed, for example, over here, and it's also true uh, in other parts of the uh, mosaic. The same the depiction, uh, which is really amazing was found also in Hovat Hamaim, Hamam, um, with uh, some uh, changes, but follow the same pattern. That's also uh, really a, a, a tell us much about the relationship and artistic, arti artistic sources that were employed by, a, a two, by, by the artists in the two synagogues. And I would like to move on to another, to a few other examples. Um, the story of the binding of Isaac, for example, appear in, appear in two different synagogues in first in, in fifth century Sepharis and sixth century Bet Alpha. I mean, iconographically speaking, we're talking about the same uh, 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 about the same uh, 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 depiction, but there are differences. I mean, um, there are some iconographical differences, many layout differences. Uh, of the story, uh, where in Sepharis it portrayed in two different panels, and in uh, in Bet Alpha in one panels, there's a detailed depiction of the two boys left at the bottom of the hill, according to uh, uh, Genesis 22, and the actual sacrifice was that was depicted over here. And also, and although the panel is uh, almost completely destroyed, enough details were uh, preserved in order to reconstruct. The actual sacrifice that took place in this a place where we see the ram tied to a tree, and that's really was the um, the evidence that uh, uh, proved that we're talking here with the story of binding of Isaac. And the last group of biblical depictions also coming from Sepharis, and um, today this is the most elaborated uh, 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 panels uh, portraying. Um, biblical depiction associating with the tabernacle and the temple. The larger panel portray a story uh, at Exodus uh, 29 uh, and depicting the concentration of uh, Aaron to the tabernacle work, where we see the laver, the water basin, the, uh, the Holocaust altar, and Aaron was depicted here, although it's destroyed, we have an inscription referring to Aaron, and then with the sacrifice that he gave on that day. And then the other depiction over here, portraying other elements that associated with the tabernacle work, the daily sacrifice, 
the table of showbread that uh, uh, was installed inside the tabernacle and temple, and also the uh, first the basket with the first fruits, all associated with the tam with the tabernacle and the temple. And the aim of those depictions it was not only to portray the biblical story or or discuss the, the the tabernacle and the lost temple, but it also serves as an expression for future aspiration, the future belief of the of the Jewish people that they, that God will eventually redeem them and will reinstall the temple in Jerusalem. So now going back, and this is the last uh, in my, the, the last uh, panel, I mean, the last uh, image on my presentation, um, looking broadly on the layout of the uh, mosaics in ancient synagogues. And today we can see, we can talk about different approaches of presenting uh, um, the themes or arranging the panels inside the uh, inside the prayer hall, uh, but uh, Sepharis and Bet Alpha portray one one approach where the biblical depiction and the zodiac are portrayed in the main hall, and the eyes were decorated with geometrical design. Here they included also some inscriptions. Where the synagogue at Chovat Hamam, dated to the late third, early fourth century, and the synagogue from Chukov from the early fifth century, um, we find the biblical depiction spread all over the mosaic. In the center, in the main hall, but also in the eyes. This is not an updated uh, plan, but Jody Magnus, director of the excavation, um, uh, um, already uh, uh, expose the panels that appear over here and also beginning of panels over there. And they're all portraying biblical depictions. And that's really tell us uh, of the different approaches that they coexist, especially the one from Kukok and Sepharis at the same time, but they use different approach, approaches in arranging, you know, in, in building the layout of the mosaic. And that's really raising questions. Why the, uh, the commu two communities um, living approximately at the same time, each of them chose different type of, uh, of arrangement and the sets of depictions to be included in their floors. But that's a more complicated question, which I won't have time to go into it uh, uh, at this uh, presentation. So if I sum up, I, I really want to introduce you with the, with the synagogue, the architecture of the synagogue, the, the, the artistic uh, representation in the synagogue and the liturgy, and especially how the institution <coughs> developed uh, in terms of architecture, art, and liturgy from the late second temple period to third century, and then throughout the antiquity. And I hope, um, the things are uh, uh, now uh, uh, clear, uh, and 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 if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks so much. That was a wonderful overview, and I know it gave everyone a lot of food for thought. And uh, I I know a, a lot of folks will have questions. Um, I'd like to invite everyone to write your questions in the chat, and I will read them. And um, I'll start off as people are doing that. And I really do encourage the students to ask questions as well. Um, as everyone does that, I'd like to start off by asking you um, if you could talk about the process of discovering the mosaics. I know students are really interested in archaeology. A lot of our, a few of our students have excavated, uh, some have even excavated in Israel, some of these sites that you're mentioning, um, and are around some of the sites that you're mentioning. And I um, think they would really enjoy hearing, you know, the process of discovering the mosaics, the conservation, and then how do you display them to the public for the, you know, the foot traffic that comes in, you know, the sites and all of those kinds of very practical aspects of things. Okay, um, first of all, I mean, no one was going to excavate any site, nowhere I think in the world know what exactly he or she is going to excavate. You find it by chance. And that's true about many of the synagogues, especially those synagogues excavated in, more in recent years, you start to excavate. Sometimes you do have some hint 
uh, above surface, for example, in Chovat Vadi Hamam, I remember walking with Uzi Libner at the side, he showed me some uh, column drum picking out of surface. And he told me, maybe it's a synagogue. I told him, excavate, and then you'll see. And that's true also in many other, you know, in other places. So you start excavating, and then you hit at the beginning in one of the scale where you hit the mosaic, and then you clean a little bit the mosaic and see that you have some uh, Jewish imagery, and then you spread the excavation and start slowly but slowly exposing the mosaic and exposing the building. And once you have the, all the, the walls, the outer walls and everything, you are, uh, and, and so, so you, you, got, uh, you got the synagogue itself. Then it's become more complicated, the question of preservation. Um, because if it's a, an organized site, um, it's a closed site or it's a site that is um, part of the natural park authority. So it's a, uh, less complicated in terms of uh, managing and keeping the building and the mosaic and open for the public. But on the other hand, uh, like in Hukok, which is a site where is not, and no one is in charge of it and theoretically, and you start to excavate the synagogue and you have a problem because if, if you finish to excavate the synagogue in one go, it's okay. But if you continue for several years, it's a problem. Then you have to cover the mosaic and reopen it. But once the decision, decision is made by the archaeologists or by the authority, it can be the, Israel, the, the antiquity authority, which exists in any other country, or by the National Park Authority, which also exists in many countries. Then one has started to work on preservation of the mosaic. Then here specialists are coming in can be specialists from the antiquity authority, from the museum, and also private people are also doing it, and you have to uh, 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 preserve the mosaic. Uh, sometimes the archaeologists want to excavate under the mosaics, and the mosaic, when, once you excavate under the mosaic, you might find another mosaic. And that's happened in one or two places, more than one and two places. And then uh, once you finish the, um, the preservation, um, you start, I mean, whoever, whoever's in, in, in charge has to think about a, a, a presentation for the public. And then you have to plan traffic at the site, traffic around the building, nowhere people can walk on the mosaic. I mean, they're, they're creating all sorts of bridges to go around the mosaic so people can see it from, get a good look of it, but know where they can go on the mosaic. And it's uh, once, I mean, when, when such buildings are open for the public, and I think it's also true with churches and other important uh, sites, it's, uh, I think it's very important. I think it's very, yeah, I mean, for the archaeologists, and this is something that I myself, I mean, putting a lot of uh, effort in that, is really bringing the results of your work to the attention of the public. This is something which is very important, but it, it's, it's a long run. Thanks. Um, you, your screen is still shared, so maybe it's good at this point to, uh, yeah, that, that's good if we can see everyone again. That's yeah. great. Um, we have a question in the chat from one of the attendees um, who would like to know your thoughts about older synagogues in the diaspora. Um, if he or she can a bit elaborate on the question, I mean, the diaspora synagogue are extremely important. And uh, as we talk, uh, there are some, at, at least in one site in, in Turkey, they excavated the new synagogue. And it's very important because it tells a story of uh, diaspora communities. And there are also all sorts of variations between the various sites. I mean, it's, it's more variated compared to, com compared to what is known in Israel. And you have the Dura Iroko synagogue, which is a completely different story. And then you have the Saudi synagogues, which again, it's a different type of building with the other, with the other I mean, with, with a range of very interesting uh, uh, elements. And the one from Ostia, uh, which is extremely important. And if, the excavators are right. I mean, the people who reinterpreted the 
Italian excavation of the 60s, if they are right, so this definitely it's, it's, it's extremely important. So yes, it's, uh, but if, if someone wants to elaborate on the question, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, uh, the person did. Uh, he asked about specifically the synagogue at Jerba, if you have any thoughts about Ooh. that. Uh, no, the, 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 the synagogue from Jerba, it's much later. I mean, the, the people in Jerba believe that it's originated in the second temple period or slightly later. I mean, there's no evidence for that. To my mind, there's no evidence. And nowhere it listed among the synagogues I mean, the late antique synagogue, so I really can't say anything. But there's something that I think I find it personally interesting that, that you do see, and especially in, um, in synagogues, I mean, later synagogues in Northern Africa, in Egypt, in, in Cairo, you do see some traces of the read of the, of the late antique tradition. Um, for example, the seating arrangement around the, the walls and the location of the bima in the center. I mean, there are things that have been developed later on, but you can trace their origin in later the world. Thanks. Uh, we have another no. question from Professor Gasparini from here at the University of Oregon. Thank you very much. How far to the east can we find these types of mosaics with medallions and closing animals? Do you know, tell us of any similar examples in the east, maybe dated to the early Islamic period, a century? Now you don't, you don't find them in synagogues, but I do find them in churches, in Jordan, uh, in Um El Rassas. I think this is the uh, easternmost example that I know. I don't know anything beyond that. So it would be in Central Egypt, Medaba also there are examples, uh, in, uh, also in, uh, um, uh, in the Mohayat, uh, um, uh, in Mount Nebo area. I mean, those are the, the further east. Yeah, I mean, in Syria, it's also, I mean, it would follow the same line. I mean, nothing beyond that that I know, but they do continue into the early Islamic period. In, in, Umar, Mas, in Umar Asas, they are dated to the early eighth century. So this is the kind of tradition that continue. In order to answer this question, I mean, I'm talking about mosaic, but they do appear on, in wall paintings, if I'm not mistaken. In, some, in at least one Umayyad palace. I don't remember exactly when, but they do appear. I mean, the, the continuation of tradition, of this tradition do continue uh, uh, later on, but uh, I, I don't remember when. Well, thank you so I'm, much yeah. for, for your talk and for your, your answers to our questions. Um, we appreciate your, your spending this time with us today. And please uh, join me in thanking Professor Weiss again. You're more than welcome. Please join us for the next lecture in our series next Wednesday, May 18th, when Sean Burris will speak to us about making Jewish place and marking Jewish space. Jewish are at Rome, Beit Shearim, and Dura Europus. The lecture is free and open to the public, but Zoom registration is required. You can register on the Oregon Humanities Center website. Information can be found on the OHC website and in the university's events calendar.